Hello comrades, it's the Finnish Bolshevik. A topic that should interest Marxists is the history of Soviet history, or how the history of the Soviet Union has been written and is still being written today by anti-communists. The version of Soviet history we are told today has been written and is written by bourgeois researchers who are either dishonest hacks, ideologically biased, incompetent, or some combination of all the above. This may sound like an absurdly harsh judgment. Surely they're not all hacks and bad at their job. Surely they're not all so biased. But the fact is that practically all capitalist historians are the way I described. How is that possible? Some of them are quite blatant, lying for money or lying due to political bias. Some of them are clearly simply very sloppy and bad at their job. However, even in cases where the historian is quite skilled and expert, and also not purposefully dishonest, their political bias is always at least moderately anti-communist, oftentimes without them even realizing it. In fact, sometimes they don't realize it, because it is simply so deeply ingrained. Pretending to be, and even believing themselves to be, so to say above classes and non-ideological, is actually a common bourgeois trope. Just like pretending to be, or even believing themselves to be, supposedly neither capitalist nor socialist is a common fascist trope. All the so-called third path ideologies, or claiming to not support any ideology, or claiming to be neutral or non-ideological, are actually all part of capitalist ideology. As a result of their political bias, many quite capable historians, who are even quite moderate in their political views, will interpret events and facts in an anti-communist way, which makes all the difference. Sometimes even good historians go to surprising lengths to misunderstand situations and interpret them in a way that fits with their anti-communism. People always interpret events based on their world outlook. They interpret events in a way that makes sense to them. Perhaps the best example of such a historian is J. Arch Getty, but countless others could be mentioned instead. Despite being among the most neutral and most so-called leftist, Getty and his ilk are still all incredibly bourgeois in their ideology and deeply anti-communist, but in a very subtle way. In fact, historians like that can be so subtle and they contrast so strongly with the explicit anti-communists that even many communists believe Getty and his ilk to be correct about Soviet history or even sympathetic to communism. However, the problem of writing Soviet history is not about individuals. The problem is systemic. The reason why any historian who is not literally a conscious Marxist, or consciously an ally of Marxists, will practically always write the same anti-communist falsehoods, is because the entire history establishment is set up that way. They are taught by anti-communist professors with similar views to themselves. This in itself is a fascinating topic to me. The number of influential American and British historians writing on this topic is actually quite small. They all know each other, they all help each other in their books, etc. Their basic assumptions about the Soviet Union are all the same. Those assumptions have been taught to them in school and maintained by peer review and by help from their colleagues. Added to this, the history of the Soviet Union has been written using extremely bad sources. Sources that are either distortions, simply unreliable, highly biased, or even outright fabrications. In this introduction I've discussed the problems of Soviet history in general, but in this video I will be focusing on the issue of sources, and in particular I've chosen two sources to discuss. I will discuss other sources in future videos. It is often said that we know all the facts about the Soviet Union because the Soviet archives have been opened. This is actually not quite true. Only some archives are open. Furthermore, we only get to see what the biased historians choose to show us, after the anti-communist government of Putin has decided what they allow historians to see. Documents from these archives are often distorted and misused to spread anti-communism, and even in those more rare cases when we get to see documents, they are interpreted in an anti-communist way. A good example of this is the book Road to Terror by Arch Getty. I actually have a separate video about Arch Getty, so if you want to check that out, I'll put that in the description. The documents for the book were chosen by Getty based on the narrative that he wanted to paint. We don't get all the documents, we only get the ones that he selected, 
we don't get the full documents, we only get the excerpts selected by Getty, and afterwards he even tells us what we are supposed to think about the documents. In fact, Getty's interpretation of the documents is much, much longer than the excerpts of the documents that he gives. And I think oftentimes his interpretation is quite wrong. But despite the fact that some documents are now available, and have been for quite some time, writing about Soviet history has perhaps only gotten worse. Historian E. H. Carr had much less access back in the 1950s, but he wrote much more meticulously and used many more primary sources. He tried to use all the available primary sources, which is certainly not the case for most historians today. Despite some archival sources being available to researchers, historians usually still cite bad sources from a long time ago. Mostly they cite other historians, usually ones who wrote before the archives were open, and whose outlandish claims are usually excused by referring to the archives being closed. They also cite other kinds of bad sources, which have been debunked or even proved forgeries years ago, sometimes even decades ago. In this video I will discuss a couple of those. Example number one, Alexander Orlov and the secret history of Stalin's crimes. Orlov was not only cited by countless historians in the past, historians whose work is still in circulation, still being read, and still being used as a source by other historians, but Orlov is actually still being used as a source by many historians today. And yet, his stories are all fabrications, pure invention. Who was Alexander Orlov? Orlov was an agent of the Soviet secret services, but who secretly held oppositionist views hostile to the Soviet government. He opposed the political line of Stalin and the Soviet government, and cooperated with Trotskyists. He sent a letter to Trotsky, trying to expose Soviet agent Mark Sporovsky, who had infiltrated into Trotsky's group. Russian anti-communist historian Boris Volodarsky has written a book on Orlov, published in 2015, where he claims that the reason why everything Orlov ever said or wrote about the Soviet Union are lies is the following. Orlov allegedly wanted to blackmail the Soviet government. He said that as long as the Soviets leave him alone, he won't reveal any true information about the USSR. According to Volodarsky, this offer was accepted. However, to make money, Orlov wrote his sensationalist book called The Secret History of Stalin's Crimes. This book is supposed to be based on his insider knowledge as an agent of the Soviet government, but it is actually lies from beginning to end. Orlov was also clearly acting from anti-communist ideological motives. Orlov helped Joseph McCarthy persecute communists in the USA, and he also helped Trotsky. It did not matter that what he told in the American anti-communist trials was false, because the charges were typically trumped up and based on lies anyway, and he just said what McCarthy wanted him to say. Orlov also presented himself as an expert on the Spanish Civil War. He has had a huge influence on the anti-Soviet narrative around the Spanish Civil War, which is today spread by capitalists, Trotskyists, and anarchists. Volodarsky writes, quote, most of what Orlov said, even under oath, or in private discussions, has by now been established as outright invention. Unfortunately, even prominent and sufficiently cautious historians of the Spanish Civil War, not to mention less prominent and accurate scholars, continued, often quite uncritically, to include Orlov's testimonies in their books, written several decades after his death. Many others who devote their works to the Soviet history sometimes base full chapters on Orlov's so-called revelations and continue to do so." Unquote. He writes further, quote, For several decades our knowledge of clandestine Soviet operations in Spain during the Civil War was based on the books and articles written by two former Soviet intelligence operators, Walter Kravitsky, more about him later, and Alexander Orlov. While access to the primary sources in Russia was, and still remains, very limited." Unquote. Volodarsky himself also has a strong anti-communist bias, and he cannot be trusted when he attacks the Soviet Union. Alongside being a successful historian in America, he works for the CIA propaganda organization Radio Free Europe slash Radio Liberty and Voice of America.
However, we can believe him when he debunks the anti-communist Orlov. Furthermore, his debunking of Orlov is verified by many other facts. Orlov is also influential as the originator of the myth that Stalin had Leningrad First Party Secretary Sergei Kirov assassinated in order to spark the so-called Great Terror. In reality, Kirov was killed by a terrorist named Nikolaev, who was a member of the Zinoviev opposition. I actually have a four-part series about the assassination of Kirov and the Moscow trials, which I will link in the description. The topic of Kirov's death was investigated by the so-called Yakovlev Commission set up by Gorbachev. Quote, the experts noted that the source of the rumors that Stalin was behind the murder of Kirov was the text published by Alexander Orlov entitled The Secret History of Stalin's Crimes. Unquote. Volodarsky used archival documents to verify that Orlov was a fraud. However, this fact should have been obvious from the very beginning. In fact, already in the late 1980s, without access to the archives, Arch Getty was able to show this quite convincingly. He wrote, quote, It is widely asserted that Stalin conspired in the assassination of Sergei Kirov in December 1934. Yet, the evidence for Stalin's complicity is complicated and at least second-hand. In fact, if one traces the assertion that Stalin killed Kirov to its origins, one finds that, before the Cold War, no serious authority argued that Stalin was behind the assassination. The KGB defector, Alexander Orlov, was the first to make such a claim in his dubious 1953 account. It has since been widely accepted in Western academic and Soviet dissident circles. Getty says further, quote, Soviet history has no tradition of responsible source criticism. Scholars have taken few pains to evaluate bias, authenticity or authorship. Specialists have accepted so-called sources that, for understandable reasons, are anonymously attributed and treat them as primary. Given the source difficulties, this tendency is understandable but not defensible, because so much of the writing on the so-called Great Purges is descended from and based on a rather uncritical acceptance of these accounts, it is important to examine some of the more influential ones in detail. Probably the most fundamental and basic so-called source on the plans of Stalin and the inner workings of Yezhov's NKVD is that of Alexander Orlov. The secret history of Stalin's crimes is his so-called inside account of the Great Purchase. Orlov is the source of the first and most cited account of Stalin's participation in and direction of the Kirov assassination and the subsequent show trials, and is the so-called smoking gun of the Kirov killing. Orlov was an NKVD operative in the organization's foreign department, and one would therefore expect his information to be first-hand. However, during the entire period of the so-called Great Purges, Orlov was an NKVD chief in Spain during the Civil War. He was in the Soviet Union only twice for brief visits of few days each, and his so-called information is based on corridor gossip he picked up among some of his NKVD friends during those brief visits. All this is aside from any consideration of political bias. After Orlov defected to the United States, he worked for American intelligence. One might legitimately wonder whether his new friends, loyalties and perspectives colored his account. But the question of political bias only compounds the main problem with the Orlov source, the lack of proximity to events." Unquote. In other words, everything is wrong with Orlov as a source. Not only is he biased and unreliable, not only did he become a literal agent of the American secret services, but even if he had been entirely honest, which he wasn't, he was simply not in the position to know much of anything about the topics that he talked about. Example number two, Walter Krivitsky and his book, I Was Stalin's Agent, also published as In Stalin's Secret Service. Krivitsky was another agent of the Soviet secret services who held secret Trotsky sympathies. One of his colleagues named Ignis Rice, alias Ludwig, alias Poretsky, decided to defect and publicly proclaim his support for the Trotskyist so-called Fourth International. Before this, he had already been passing secret information to foreign Trotskyists. In his book on Krivitsky, anti-communist historian Gary Kern writes, quote, Poretsky calls on the working class to overthrow the regime by removing Stalinists from its midst 
and renouncing the Third International, that is Comintern, he concludes by saying, Forward to new battles for socialism and the proletarian revolution for the organization of the Fourth International. Unquote. Krivitsky met with Poretsky, but he didn't arrest him as a Trotskyist because Krivitsky was also a Trotskyist. Krivitsky argued that it was a better strategy for the Trotskyists to hide their Trotskyism and remain inside the NKVD. Now granted, Poretsky, aka Rice, himself probably would have done this, but the Soviets had begun to suspect him, and as a result he fled. This is also what Krivitsky himself ended up doing. He fled when suspicion fell on him. But at the time, in 1937, he told Rice, aka Poretsky, that they should not admit Trotskyism publicly. According to Tony Sharp, quote, Rice, aka Poretsky, contacted Krivitsky and the two men met in Paris. Rice wanted to break with Stalin in protest against the execution of the Trotsky-Buharin bloc. Krivitsky countered that a victorious revolution in Spain would save the remnants of the October Revolution in Russia and would sweep Stalin away, unquote. And as a result, they should remain inside the Soviet Union and inside the Soviet secret services and wait until they could overthrow Stalin. The Spanish Trotskyist party, PUM, was participating in the Spanish Civil War and had high hopes of maintaining influence, so this is probably what Krivitsky was referring to. The PUM eventually launched a failed uprising against the pro-Stalin government of Spain. Krivitsky also had further Trotskyist contacts. After his defection, he linked up with Alexander Barmin, who, according to Kern, quote, published in the Trotskyist press, unquote. And according to Volodarsky, quote, Kravitsky began paying almost daily visits to Trotsky's son Sedov, unquote. Kravitsky himself writes that, quote, I established connections with Leon Sedov, Trotsky's son, and with the Russian Menshevik socialists exiled in Paris, unquote. And according to Kern, Albert Goldman, Trotsky's lawyer, mentioned Kravitsky's cooperation with Trotsky. According to Kern, Krivitsky also collaborated with capitalist intelligence services of at least four countries. Here we can see how all the different reactionaries, the Mensheviks, Trotskyists, and capitalist governments were all working together against the USSR. After his open defection to the USA, Krivitsky also worked with the FBI. He wrote his best-selling anti-communist propaganda book, I Was Stalin's Agent, which is pure lies. Orlov had falsely claimed to have been a general, who knew everything the Soviet government was doing. Now, this was impossible, because the rank of NKVD general was not established until after World War II, while Orlov had already defected long before that. Krivitsky had claimed to have been the head of all Soviet intelligence in Western Europe. In reality, he was a much more low-level operative, with very little actual information. He gave all the information he had to the FBI. Getty writes, quote, Similar to, but less influential than Orlov, is the work by Walter Kravitsky. Kravitsky was purportedly a Soviet military intelligence chief for Western Europe. Because of his position abroad, he too is unable to provide much first-hand information on events in the Soviet Union. Like Orlov, Kravitsky reported corridor gossip he heard during trips to Moscow. Unquote. Getty also says that, quote, Many of the linchpins of the Western interpretation on Soviet history are based almost solely on an uncritical acceptance of rumors from persons not in the position to know. They are not primary sources that cast light on central decision-making or even on events on a national scale." Unquote. According to Getty, history writing on the Soviet Union, quote, would be considered sloppy and methodologically bankrupt scholarship in any other area of inquiry. Unquote. This is why I've often said that the state of scholarship in the field of Soviet history is worse than probably in any other field. Yet, despite his valuable comments, Getty himself does not escape the pitfall of anti-communism and capitalist bias. Now, I didn't take the time to comb through countless anti-communist history books, but I randomly checked four from different years, all of which are mainstream and even best-selling, influential and so-called authoritative. The ones I checked are The Great Terror by Robert Conquest from 1968, The Black Book of Communism edited by Courtois from 1997, 
The Rise and Fall of Communism by Archie Brown from 2009, and Stalin Waiting for Hitler by Stephen Kotkin from 2017. And they all cite both Orlov and Kravitsky. Not just one or the other, but both. The state of anti-communist history writing is indeed pitiful. Recently I've been reading Christopher Andrews' book, The Sword and the Shield, about the history of the NKVD, because the book claimed to be based on archival leaks, the so-called Mitrokin archive. However, that book, despite its boast of using archival sources, was actually extremely bad quality, much worse than I even expected, probably due to bias and deliberate lying, as Christopher Andrew is actually the official historian of the British Secret Service, MI5. Anyway, that book also cites Orlov, and slightly also cites Kravitsky, despite all of its claims of having access to archives. It is quite telling. They supposedly have all the best sources available, they have all the archives and everything, and yet, what do they do? They choose to rely on proven fabrications that have been debunked years or even decades ago. In a future video, I will discuss more such sources on Soviet history.